wanted to spend a few minutes today talking about an issue the whole country is facing, which is high fuel costs, and some initiatives to help mitigate them. There are no easy fixes to these challenges, given the global nature of prices, but there are steps we can take now to become more resilient in the future and less dependent on the volatile fossil fuel market. First, I realize we're just finishing up with winter and we're getting closer to the warmer months, but now is the time to think about making efficiency upgrades for next winter to save costs over the long run. That's why in the budget I propose, I ask the legislature to appropriate 80 million towards weatherization. This is in addition to the roughly 20 million investment in weatherization we made just last year. Fortunately, this is one area in the House passed budget where we agree, and I hope the Senate does as well. Weatherization is beneficial for many reasons. It saves money, reduces carbon emissions, and combats climate change. You can learn more about state weatherization programs on the Department for Children and Family website. You could also, um, or you should also, check with your utility. Many of them have efficiency programs and incentives to help with upfront costs. Now on the transportation side, I continue to be a strong supporter of electric vehicles. This year I propose millions in electric vehicle incentives to make this transition more affordable. We're also going to continue to build out our charging infrastructure. The decision we made a few years ago to use the Volkswagen settlement money for, the, for this purpose has made us a national leader. But we have much more to do. That's why I'm happy to see the transportation bill from the House has funded many of these requests, which build on initiatives from last year. Currently, Vermonters can get up to 4,000 in state incentives for EVs in addition to rebates from some utilities and up to 7,500 in federal tax credits. You can visit driveelectricvt.com to see which makes and models are eligible as well as to calculate your savings. I've long said that EVs are part of our future and will save people money in the long run. The transportation sector is also our largest contributor of carbon emissions. So the faster we make the transition, the better off we'll be from both an environmental and a cost standpoint. For example, gas prices, as we all are keenly aware, average over $4 a gallon today. While electric costs for charging your EV equal about $150 per gallon. And I don't think we'll see gas prices at that level anytime soon. But I know what you're thinking. Not everyone can afford or even find a new vehicle of any type right now, which is why continuing to work to make them more affordable and accessible is a priority. So in the near term, the Agency of Transportation continues to work to make transportation alternatives available. You can go to connectingcommuters.org to find schedules for local and commuter bus, bus options and free fares uh, through at least June. The service is also a good way to join a carpool, find the right park and ride location, or plan a convenient bike commute. My administration will continue to focus efforts on investing in greener and more affordable transportation. And before I turn it over, to help Vermonters who are dealing with high costs right now. I also want to again make a pitch for my progressive tax relief package, which costs about the same amount as the House tax plan. But mine helps over a quarter of taxpayers compared to theirs, which will only benefit about 10% of the population. My plan allows Vermonters to fully deduct their student loan interest from their income tax saving many thousands a year. It also finally eliminates the income tax on military pensions, which I've talked about for years. It would further cut the income tax on Social Security benefits and expand the Earned Income Tax Credit, which has been proven to be one of the most effective anti-poverty tax relief proposals there is. 
To make child care more affordable, it would also expand the child care tax credit. And to help uh, folks deal with inflation, I've also proposed sending Vermont residential property taxpayers a rebate check of about $275 because you overpaid. We have a surplus and you should get some of that back. Not a credit, but a rebate that you can use right now. Although these ideas weren't taken up in the House, I'm hopeful the Senate will consider them because of how beneficial these proposals would be for their constituents. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you, Governor. Good morning, or I guess it's afternoon now. I just have a few comments today. First, as a reminder, for those who can't see some of the slides I'm going to show, the modeling slides that I reference are available at the Department of Financial Regulation's COVID-19 website. But before I start with the slides, shortly before this briefing, I think they just knew this was going to alter the briefing, uh, we learned from the FDA that they have now authorized second booster shots of both the Pfizer and Moderna for everyone 50 and older. They also authorized an additional booster dose for people ages 12 and older who have certain immune deficiencies. Now this is very new information and we've not yet had the opportunity to review the details about the authorization. We'll do so quickly as we have for every move in the last several years and we'll keep Vermonters informed of actions and guidance including about receiving these booster shots. Now to get to some of the data, the BA2 subvariant of Omicron continues to make up an increasingly high percentage of cases. It's now over 72% in New England and it's close to 55% across the country. However, as you'll see, cases are not growing exponentially, which is a good sign. In fact, on this first slide, you can see that the seven-day average of cases in Vermont is actually down 11% in the past week to 131. Over the last week, Vermont reported 109 fewer cases compared to the previous week, which is now 916. And you can see that in this epidemic curve, things are quite stable, even if they're being prolonged a little by the BA2 variant. And this is at a time when testing, though it says decreasing 5.5%, has not really changed much at all. So state testing has been stable during this time period. In terms of the modeling, new cases are expected to remain relatively low in the coming weeks, with some element of uncertainty due to the fact that this is the BA2 subvariant, but not a wide variation in uh, the modeling predictions. Hospitalizations remain steady and quite low. down 87% from the Omicron peak, continuing to decrease. The number today is 12. Even more gratifying is the number of people in the ICU, down 94% since the peak, and at zero today. And in only 31% of recent COVID admissions was COVID actually the reason for admission. Vermont continues to have the nation's lowest hospitalization rate. Unfortunately, death does continue to be a harsh reality with this virus, but it's noteworthy that deaths continue to decrease, as you can see, and the number of deaths in March, with only a few days remaining in the month, is one-fifth of the level of each of the three preceding months. Now, BA2, as you know, is a more contagious version of Omicron, which itself was more contagious than the Delta variant. So it is possible that there may be a slight uptick in cases. 
it still is proving itself to cause less severe illness for most people, and Vermonters remain highly protected through vaccination. We will keep watching our data and monitor any changes closely. And we continue to strongly recommend that everyone stay up to date on vaccines and get tested if you have any symptoms. And by saying strongly recommend staying up to date, that recommendation predates what the FDA did today. And so for those who have yet to get the booster that was previously recommended, please keep in mind uh, that would be a very, very uh, positive thing to do to prevent serious outcomes of disease. In the meantime, please continue to take any precautions appropriate for your own comfort level and personal risk. And again, please take into account the risk of the people you will be with, especially older folks, children too young to be vaccinated, and people who may be immunocompromised. As you make these decisions, please remember that the easing of broad public health recommendations does not mean COVID is gone but the risk is lower for us all, even though the virus is still with us, and we still need to consider when and how we may need to protect ourselves and those around us, depending on our circumstances. Now, one of the things that the BA2 subvariant has changed is that one of the monoclonal antibody treatments, sotrovimab, is no longer being used in our region, where the variant is now prevalent due to concern over its effectiveness. So the federal, federal government has ceased shipping that to states in higher prevalence regions for BA2. But that doesn't mean we have no treatment. In fact, we have a number of other treatments still available which will be effective, including the monoclonal antibody bebtilovimab and the pill Paxlovid. If you're at higher risk from serious illness from COVID-19 and you do test positive, please reach out to your healthcare provider as soon as possible to ask about such treatments. Finally, last time I previewed that uh, we were planning to shift the offering of COVID vaccine from large statewide clinics to pharmacies and healthcare providers, the traditional medical homes where we receive other vaccines. While these large clinics have been incredibly successful since the initial rollout, they've had very low uptake recently. Now the clinics that we listed on our website will not be going away, but starting this Friday, April 1st, they will be walk-in only, and appointments will no longer need to be made through the health department registration system. New clinics may still be added, but on a smaller community level scale. We still encourage Vermonters to get vaccinated or boosted by walking into a clinic or making an appointment through a pharmacy or your health care provider. <coughs> Vaccines are free, widely available across the state. We're hopeful that the pandemic is waning, but two years of experience and heartbreak tells us we have to stay ready for any new curveballs the virus may throw at us. And being up to date on your vaccinations is how you can best protect yourself against serious illness. You can find the list of clinics on our website, healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Starting folks in the room. Governor, as, as of this morning, we now have three counties, Washington, Windsor, and Essex, that are uh, classified as high spread by the CDC's new guidance. Um, I guess I'm wondering if you and Dr. Levine could refresh us on, on what that guidance is from the CDC yeah, the, and the, whether any change is needed on. Yeah, again, from the very beginning, when all of this started, we decided not to go with the CDC uh, per county uh, type of, uh, of approach. Uh, because we, you know, we travel to different communities, uh, we travel to different counties, we work in different places, we, we're just so intertwined with everyone else, small state. 
Um, so that didn't make a lot of sense to us. When you look at the hospitalizations, as Dr. Levine just said, zero in the ICU today. Uh, nine, is it nine? Twelve. Uh, Twelve uh, in the hospital with COVID. That doesn't mean they got there because of COVID. I think it's about less than half of that. So um, we are very confident in, in our approach, looking at the metric of the hospitalizations. Uh, but there's, there's a nuance uh, to what the CDC is doing as well, and it has to do with uh, hospital staffing as well. So I'll let Dr. Levine explain that. As you know, these community levels use several different data, data points, the number of new cases per 100,000, new, new admissions per 100,000, the percentage of people in a hospital uh, that are there for COVID specifically. And they, they created the system to really work for the whole country. And I have to say, frankly, it works better in some places than in others. Small states, especially small states with rural counties like ours, appear to have more unpredictable and variable case rates in these counties. And the difference between a count or a color on the map can literally be a few cases. And we've, done, we've seen that as we analyze the data every week when it comes out from the CDC. Um, most of the time when a county has veered from green to another color, it's literally on the border of the two and it's just made it into the next color range. The community levels start with the cases per 100,000. So if you're already over the 200 cases per 100,000, you can only be yellow or red. And we have a few counties that meet that criterion alone. But these are the counties like Essex County that have very small populations, which often means a small number of cases leads to a very high rate. The map also takes into account, as I said, hospitalization rates. And again, here, small changes can make a very big difference. And in one of our hospitals, we've learned that a number of the staffed beds actually decreased because a number of the traveling nurses um, were not rehired again and weren't needed. Number of staffed beds went down, but if the number of COVID cases stayed the same, it makes it look like you've had an increase in your hospitalization rate for COVID. So again, we're often very close to the cutoff in these levels and a little movement makes a big difference sometimes when you look at the data. We really do believe that looking statewide at the data um, with all the data that we can aggregate in that way really helps us provide a lot more consistency in our recommendations, especially across counties where our highly mobile population lives and whether they cross lines to shop, to get educated, to work, um, that happens all the time in our small state. So that's kind of how we approach this at this point. And I would just caution people that um, one can get into an endless cycle of uh, reacting and overreacting to data without looking for good trends. And you can be sort of panicking one week, uh, next week saying, oh, glad we, you know, got by that one, and then the next week go, oh my God, I have to panic again. And that's not the way we want people to live. We think that the new way of living with the pandemic will rely on more trend data and on our statewide data. Following up on that, one school district nearby, they've already gone back to masking. Some businesses here in Montpelier are reinstating it. Within the state house, they're even keeping it in committee rooms. Um, so, I mean, should people be changing their behavior? People should change their behavior in whatever way is comfortable for them on an individual basis, for sure, because everyone's having challenges with transition at this point in time. But we don't believe that uh, the recommendation for schools or other businesses should be so labile based on one piece of data at one time and then changing at another time for another piece of data. Uh, I don't know if Secretary French may have something to say about the schools, though. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Levine. I think, you know, just to echo on, on what folks have said so far, I think it is problematic 
uh, in Vermont in particular due to the small size of our counties to uh, operationalize that at the school district level on a weekly basis essentially uh, promotes way too much instability in our schools um, at a time when we need to have greater stability. So as we've said throughout the pandemic uh, to superintendents and school folks that they really should defer uh, to the Vermont Department of Health um, in interpreting the context and applying that specifically in Vermont. Um, we've done that successfully throughout the pandemic, um, and I would encourage schools to do that now. Just to reinforce once more, we have 12 people in the hospital today with COVID. Four, only four are in for COVID. The rest, 12, zero in the ICU. I think we're doing pretty well. Uh, with regard to fuel costs, specifically home heating costs, since companies can set their own prices, is there any idea of whether these companies are price gouging right now to take advantage of consumers just given the fuel cost climate? I'm, I'm not aware of anyone. They're all competing with each other as well. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not hearing that there's any price gouging, but that might be a better question for the Attorney General. Governor, some criticism of the, um, of the transportation bill is that perhaps we haven't put enough into roads and bridges and we're putting a heck of a lot into the, uh, into the electric uh, cars and, uh, and getting that infrastructure going. Your, your reaction? No, I, think, I think we're actually, <clears throat> if you take a look at the uh, transportation budget uh, between uh, the money that we have that we normally program uh, and the additional money we're receiving from the federal government, uh, we're probably at historic levels for both paving roads, bridges, traditional infrastructure. So I'm not concerned uh, about that at this point in time. Uh, we'll see how the, uh, the transportation bill makes it through uh, the rest of the process. Um, but, um, but again, there's a lot of construction out there right now. And what my biggest concern uh, is inflation, uh, inflationary pressure and that we're getting actually more projects completed um, and not just inflating the prices of those. Governor, quickly, I want to ask about the beta technologies. Um, the South Burlington Development Review Board is going to be revisiting or holding a special meeting um, where beta may have to seek more, more local uh, construction permits. Are you concerned that Beta, if, if they have to go through this process, are you concerned that they may look or take their business elsewhere? I'm very concerned. Um, this is something that I've been concerned about for quite some time. Uh, I've been uh, made aware of this uh, this latest uh, issue with the DRB in South Burlington. Uh, it all uh, is because of a parking lot. Um, most of the regulations apparently say the parking lot has to be behind the building, right? When you're building something new, parking lot goes behind. Well, this is a little bit different. Uh, this is uh, beta where they're building aircraft and they're doing it next to the Burlington Airport. Uh, and the front of the house is actually the runway. So um, you, can't, you can't put parking. I mean, traditionally we think about a building where the front entrance is off from the highway. That's not their front entrance. This is, again, they do all their business off the runway. So to put uh, the parking and trying to reconfigure their whole design and move their operations closer to the highway so they can have parking behind their, um, their building, it just makes no sense at all. Um, so uh, hopefully they'll revisit that uh, if they can't fix it either the DRB can't fix it or the city of South Burlington um, can't fi the council can't fix it I'll seek a legislative fix um, because this is too important for Vermont uh, this is not just about jobs for Chittenden County this is going to have a ripple effect across the entire state whether it's Franklin County Washington County Rutland County all across Vermont and uh, this is uh, transformational. And this is going to change uh, Vermont in, in a positive way. Uh, when you consider, I think this is as big as when IBM decided to locate in Vermont. 
this is going to have that big uh, an impact on us. And it's green, green energy, green technology, cutting edge. They have hundreds of aircraft already online, ordered, and they're begging us. They're, they, they want to stay in Vermont. This is the leadership of Beta wants to be here. But they have another uh, alternative, and that's across the pond in Plattsburgh. And they have an airport there. They have, they have space available. Uh, they have everything that they need, and they could quickly, quickly change course and go to Plattsburgh. And I just can't let that happen. We can't let that happen. This is too important to Vermont. And they don't want to let it happen either. So it seems like there's a path forward somehow. Um, and again, hopefully the DRB will be able to fix this, if not the city council. Uh, but then I'll, I'll address and ask the legislature to do something quickly. Because just delaying this project by a month could mean a delay of up to three or four months. Then we get into uh, weather issues. Um, you know, we have a tight construction year in Vermont. Uh, as well, they have contracts that they've signed. So they're not going to have much choice. If this is delayed, they may not have any choice but to seek another alternative location. But they want to be here. All right, we'll move to the phones. Starting with Wilson Ring, the Associated Press. Uh, hi, everybody. As always, thanks so much for letting us participate here remotely. Uh, this is another question, I guess, a variation on the uh, statistical question that, that I, don't, I don't know who answered it first, but Dr. Levine answered it at great length. Over the last several weeks, I've noticed that uh, depending on whose statistics you're reading, Vermont's cases of per capita case, COVID cases has been rising up the, uh, has been rising up the charts. And today, the New York Times shows Vermont has the second highest per capita. And I certainly understand about the good news about uh, it is the lowest with the hospitalization and the deaths are low. But what is going on with the, the case, the raw case numbers that are driving up those statistics? I think it comes down to our, our robust uh, testing. I think we're testing a lot in Vermont. In fact, I think per capita may be one of the highest uh, in the country. So that, you know, leads to more cases. I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's just it leads to more cases. But I'll let Dr. Levine answer that further. Yeah, thanks, Wilson. We asked that same thing at our uh, health operations call this morning, and we're still not clear on why the New York Times data looks that different. Originally, it looked different because there was a part of the state that there were a bunch of cases that were added back retrospectively as part of data cleanup, and um, that should no longer be the reason at this point in time, especially when you look at the number of cases I showed in the uh, earlier slides where clearly we're on a decreasing trend, not an increasing trend, and there's so few cases being reported. Um, so it doesn't make a lot of sense, and it's a little bit inconsistent, if you will, if we, if we actually have the lowest hospitalization rate and amongst the lowest death rate, um, cases don't really fit that mold at all. As the governor said, we are actually if you ignore the District of Columbia, which is the highest, we are the, the number one state for testing. So we know a lot more about cases than any other state just because we're finding them. But other than that, I can't give you uh, any better reason. Okay, thank you very much. Lisa Loomis, The Valley Reporter. Hello, this question is probably for Dr. Levine. Um, I was reading this morning that Evu Sheld, and um, forgive me if I pronounced that or if I butchered that pronunciation, the injectable COVID treatment, which can help immunocompromised and healthy people from catching COVID, has been ordered federal government to the tune of 850,000 doses. And I also read that 8% of those doses are sitting unused in warehouses, hospitals, and pharmacies. Does Vermont have doses of this injectable, and do we have calls for using it? Yes, yeah, so your pronunciation was fine. 
uh, Ev Usheld. And, Thank you. And 80% um, is correct, so across the country, 80% of the doses do not seem to have been used. They're being warehoused, if you will. I don't know the percent of doses in Vermont that fit that, but we have abundant doses available to be used in Vermont. We have had plenty of doses used, by the way, uh, but it's always hard to know if it's the appropriate number because this is for a very select population. These are people who are uh, immunocompromised or for whatever reason aren't going to be able to benefit from the vaccine. So that's a small percentage of the total population um, and it all depends on how their clinicians interpret the risk. Some of these people may have a disease that leads to immunocompromise. Many who are eligible, though, have diseases that are being treated with medications that make you immunocompromised. And that can be in the rheumatology field, the dermatology field, gastroenterology, um, transplants, you name it. Uh, so. There's a whole host of people who just may not have assessed their risk as being high enough to warrant using this preventive medication, even though they might benefit from it. Got it. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Hello, Governor. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the, the commuter connect. Uh, what I'm wondering is that that's, that's a real incentive, whereas the legislature, at least in the, in the transportation bill, is using uh, more of a requirement where they're requiring employers to have their own commuter plans uh, to reduce uh, the number of commuters. Seems sort of a, a carrot and stick approach and I'm wondering uh, what you think about that, using uh, a requirement instead of an incentive to reduce fossil fuel commuter traffic. Well, again, I always uh, would prefer uh, the carrot approach and uh, trying to provide incentives to do that. I think the incentive uh, today is the high cost of fuel. And, uh, and I think that the looking for the alternative types of uh, transportation would be important. Uh, I wasn't aware of the uh, stick approach that you're referring to, but we'll we'll take a look. Um, I just hadn't heard that part. Okay, uh, we've also had small outbreaks of a highly contagious avian flu in three neighboring states. A cyber attack this month that shut down milk production at H.B. Hood and Booth Brothers, and the New York Times is talking about global hunger due to supply chain energy problems, Ukraine, and I'm wondering. Uh, I guess it's really two questions. One for Secretary French, if he's available. Uh, how the cyber attack affected school milk supplies. And also, if your administration is thinking about possible Vermont food shortages, and if so, what are you planning to do about it? Um, first of all, uh, I would just say uh, that we're very aware of the cyber attacks, something we've been talking about for quite some time. and and that risk has been heightened uh, due to the issue in Ukraine uh, with the Russian uh, trying to, to take, uh, disrupt uh, all kinds of economies, uh, including our own. Um, so we're, uh, we're on top of that. Uh, we've been trying to put in firewalls uh, in uh, many of our, uh, throughout our technology uh, system uh, to prevent uh, some of this from happening. But, um, Having said that, uh, it really is only as strong as the weakest link, and sometimes that's us. And uh, clicking on the wrong link uh, might let a bad actor in. So our uh, secretary of, uh, at the Agency of Digital Services, uh, as well as our public uh, safety commissioner, uh, have been working uh, in tandem, working together with our cabinet uh, to try and make sure that we're aware of what's happening. So. Again, um, we're, we're well aware of, uh, of what they're trying to do, and uh, we're preventing, trying to prevent that from happening. Uh, in terms of uh, feeding ourselves, again, uh, trying to work with the Secretary of Agriculture uh, in many different ways, 
coming, I, I think a lot of what we've been through over the last couple of years, I think opens our eyes more to trying to take care of ourselves, um, both as a nation, uh, but as, as well as a state. Um, so uh, we have been uh, trying to uh, use the working lands initiatives uh, as well as to try and uh, make sure that people are aware uh, that we need our farms. We, this is part of the backbone of Vermont, um, but we need them to feed ourselves. It's, uh, it's something that simple and it, and it really is about uh, the public safety uh, aspect uh, of, uh, of our state as well. So having said that, we're still uh, pushing forward. Um, Secretary uh, Tebbets uh, probably can answer some of the questions about what we're doing about that, but you know, slaughterhouses, uh, trying to incentivize uh, more farming production in different ways and providing modernization in that, uh, that respect, it's all on the table and something that we've been, we've been doing for a number of years now. Um, Secretary French, are you aware of any, I, I don't believe there was any shortage of milk due to the uh, cyber attack, but I think it was, that was sh fairly short lived. Yes, Governor, I'm, I'm unaware of any uh, impact on school food supply. Uh, I would just highlight uh, in parallel that we uh, have resources on cybersecurity for school districts at the agency. Um, we've been highlighting those resources in the last couple of weeks, and it's something I'll have on my list to highlight with the superintendents when I meet with them on Thursday. What sort of resources, Mr. Secretary? Uh, we have national level resources that are uh, put out for schools. Um, they're on our website. I'd be happy to share a link with that uh, guy if you'd like. Thank you. I would. Thank you. Greg Sikanik, Bennington Banner. Good afternoon. Uh, I believe this question might be for either Secretary French or Secretary Moore. Uh, this is with regards to school sports in the spring. Uh, some readers in Brattleboro have asked us if there are going to be any masking requirements for high school sports in Vermont in the spring, and if so, what they are. Secretary French, I don't believe there are, Greg, but Secretary French? Uh, that's correct. No, no mask requirements. Most of the spring sports are outdoors. It's something we had on our radar as we were... Um, making the transition to the March 14th guidance, but we have no plans for that at this moment. Okay. Um, right, um, actually, uh, one, one more question, Governor. Uh, the federal government did uh, announce that, that the United States would be accepting 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Uh, sort of, I asked the same question last week and realized these things move slowly, but just checking to see if there's any if uh, you've been made aware of any opportunities for Vermont to uh, accept any of those refugees. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any at this point in time. Uh, obviously, we've been focusing on uh, the Afghan refugees, and we've made great strides there, as you are well aware. I think we have over 200 now who have relocated to Vermont. Um, but uh, we welcome any Ukrainians. I, I will say I was at a... Uh, Rotary Chamber of Commerce uh, luncheon last week in Windsor County, uh, and there's a Springfield uh, student, exchange student from Ukraine, and uh, the Rotary is trying to raise money uh, to bring his family uh, into uh, into the state here in Vermont. Uh, they have a place, uh, I think it's a, um, a local uh, parish of some sort that maybe has housing uh, for them. Uh, but they're trying to to raise money uh, to do that. And this was before the announcement, the Biden uh, announcement of the 100,000. So uh, I did, um, I did uh, put out that information uh, to our uh, congressional delegation, and uh, hopefully uh, we can provide um, the resources necessary to bring this family in and anyone else uh, that uh, may have relatives as well. So uh, we, again, uh, remain ready, willing, and able to do whatever we can uh, to help those who are, you know, in conflict right now and in danger in their own country or in uh, other countries, Poland, for, in for instance, as well. Okay, thank you very much, Governor. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. <clears throat> Thanks, Jason. Uh, uh, Dr. Levine, uh, what is 
uh, what are you advising on the second booster for people over 50? Um, as I said at the beginning of my comments, since it just came out literally minutes before the press conference, we need to read closely what the FDA is saying and analyze what data they have provided uh, to make that recommendation. <clears throat> I will note that what I've seen thus far says from the FDA that people over age 50 may receive uh, another booster as opposed to uh, a stronger recommendation than that. But that's about all I have to go on right this moment, and we'll have more to say after we've done our review. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Governor, I was curious um, if there's some way to work on a protocol when it comes to missing persons. Uh, had a lot of feedback recently when state police have put out notices of people who are missing and when the press cooperates and tries to get information out, the one comment I get back the most often is we never hear or rarely hear when they're found or if they haven't been found uh, and oftentimes have to go looking to see. Uh, and uh, it was quite a long conversation I had from different people who were saying that it would be great if the, if the state police would follow up uh, just as they do with the first report about the missing to when they're found. I think that's a, a great point, Tom. Uh, unfortunately, Commissioner Sherling isn't on today, uh, nor is uh, Deputy Commissioner Morrison, but uh, I'll have one of them get in touch with you and uh, see what we can put together because that does make a lot of sense. Like we, we do, uh, I think, a fairly good job or I've seen a lot of the media reports uh, where there's been missing people, but we need to tell the good news too. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, one last question. I don't know if you know or I'll have to wait for Commissioner Sherling. If <clears throat> recent saturation patrol picked up 19 motorists who were using their electronic handheld devices. Most of them were texting. Uh, do you know if they were cited and, and, and actually written up for a ticket or were they just doing a warrant? I don't know. Um, I would assume so, but I, I really don't know. Um, we can have them follow up with you on that as well. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Governor, open the conference with um, uh, comments on rising gas prices and other inflationary pressures. Wondering if uh, at the state level there's any projections or anticipation of whether that will have a, a dampening effect on summer tourism or um, the wider economy for that matter. Um, you know, it's hard to say, and uh, and it really depends on whether it goes any higher. It is heading down a bit now. Um, hopefully, that's a trend that will continue. Um, but I I haven't I haven't heard uh, that there is any uh, concern uh, about some of the travel. Um, and I think from our standpoint as well, uh, we're going to benefit from the border opening up so we'll have more uh, travel uh, that was what we've been missing for the last couple of years from our canadian friends uh, basically most of them from quebec so that has opened up and and we look forward to that uh, and uh, and from what i'm seeing uh, of of late in terms of the activity on our roadways um, i'm not seeing uh, that there's fewer people traveling from uh, other parts of uh, the Northeast. So those trends, even with the higher gas prices, we're still seeing people come for skiing and so forth, and, and we're not seeing that uh, decrease. Um, it seems to be staying uh, pretty steady. Okay, thank you very much. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, Governor, it was a little over two years ago that uh, you declared the pandemic. Can you tell us what criteria that you have to, for the day, when the day comes when you can stand at a press conference and say the pandemic is over? Is it based on regional or Vermont data? 
Is it based on number of deaths? At what point? At what point can you say the pandemic is officially ended, even if there's still COVID positive both COVID cases? Yeah, I think I think we can safely at this point in time say that we've transitioned to endemic. Um, but to say it's over, I just can't predict the future. I just don't know um, the next variant. I just don't know. Um, so we're going to have to. We don't have a real playbook on this, uh, especially with uh, COVID and all the variants that come along with it. But so far, so good. I mean, it's uh, this is great news uh, that we provided today, uh, and um, we think that because the the last strains uh, were so transmissible that a lot of people either have had been vaccinated or have actually had COVID as a result. So we have a lot of natural immunity built in. Um, so uh, again, we'll, we'll take one day at a time or one week at a time or one month at a time, but right now it's looking pretty good. And I'll let Dr. Levine add to that. Just, just one quick addition. <clears throat> Um, I don't believe Governor Scott declared that we had a pandemic in March. Uh, it was more, uh, we were part of an epidemic here in the U.S. and part of a state of emergency. But pandemic has worldwide implications, and that was really the World Health Organization. And so no matter what we say in Vermont, I think most of us realize that the rest of the world is still having um, many places where this virus is quite active and causing a lot of um, death at times and certainly hospitalizations and illnesses at other times. And we know that vaccination rates in places like Africa, many of the countries are literally 12 or 14 percent. So uh, I don't think on a worldwide stage uh, anyone's been ready to say the pandemic is over. But I do agree with the governor that we are certainly transitioning our behaviors to more of an endemic posture uh, with circumstances the way they are in our region and in our state right now. Very good. Thank you very much. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hey, Governor, uh, you know, I noticed in the um, jobs report from late last week that professional business services was up, which has been kind of a, a problem for Vermont over the years, long before the pandemic. I was wondering if you would know why uh, jobs in that high paying sector would be up at this at this point. What are you what are you seeing? Um, I, I don't know. Maybe it is the high pay. Maybe it's people seeking uh, to relocate to a safer state um, and maybe even work rem remotely. I just, I just don't know. It's a good point, but uh, hopefully that will continue. Um, I had a, an EV question, actually. I have a, a fully EV car, and one of the things I've noticed is that the state could really use a lot more um, fast chargers, you know, the level three uh, DC chargers. I see you nodding your head. I was wondering if you have plans to put them into the um, the rest stops along the along the highway. Um, I'm not sure that we can do that, um, but I, I will check uh, with our transportation folks because uh, I know we can't uh, because we use federal funding to build some of the rest areas on the highways uh, that we can't sell gas, for instance. We can't sell products uh, at the rest areas, so I'm not sure if we can sell electricity either uh, to charge but uh, we'll certainly check uh, some of um, you know we are encouraging uh, and we're trying to uh, to make available uh, some in the uh, commuter lots uh, that uh, that would be one area if we could designate those uh, those areas as uh, charging locations with faster charging capabilities uh, as well as uh, with some of the convenience stores and so forth along the highway. So um, we're moving in that direction. We want to make it as, as easy as possible, and, um, and, but, but point well taken. But I'll check on that because I, I, I don't believe we can, but, but I'll check to be sure. Okay. I've noticed them like in the New York State Thruway, they have them at the, the, the tourist stop, that they have rest stops there. Yeah, I think. But they, they sell gasoline there too. Yeah, so. see, they they didn't they didn't use federal money uh, to build them. They used tolls uh, and bonded for it. Uh, so they have 
more flexibility than we do. We accepted federal money, so we're under restriction to for a lot of things uh, in Vermont uh, in terms of why, I mean, we received 90 to 95 percent of federal funding uh, to build the highways, and they did it on their own. Okay. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Governor. Yep. Colin Flanders, seven days. Hi, thanks. Um, a couple hours ago, the Department of Corrections announced that it was um, placing the, the superintendent at the Newport prison on paid administrative leave and that the superintendent will not be returning to his position. Um, but the, the press release announcing this contains very little details about why this happened. I'm, I'm curious if we can get um, a better explanation of, of why this change is occurring. Yeah, I'm aware of the situation and have been briefed, uh, but I may refer that one to Secretary Samuelson if she's on. Yes, absolutely. And thank you uh, for the question. These are always really difficult decisions. Vermont DOC is leaning into a significant culture change to aim improving morale and well being of both staff and incarcerated individuals. I think it's important uh, to achieve these goals. Um, that the change requires clear and proactive leadership with a focus on making the best decisions in good faith and in, and with integrity. Um, as you noted yesterday, um, following concerns that were raised and a thorough review by DOC and human resources that over the past month, Superintendent Scott Martin was put on administrative leave and will not be returning to his, his post. Assistant Superintendent Mike Kohler will serve as acting superintendent Again, this was a difficult decision and was unrelated to um, death earlier this month of Michael Purnell or the seven days article. Um, for more information, Commissioner Demo and his team um, are happy to take and answer questions offline. Um, so if folks reach out, we can make that connection for you. Okay, I'm sure we'll, we, will, we will be following up with Commissioner um, Dell, but I'm just curious, or Dell, I'm sorry, I'm just curious if there's anything else you can say at this point. I mean, concerns were raised. Or is there any indication of what types of concerns, what we're talking about here? Yeah, I can't delve into it deeply, but the concerns come out of, come out of his management and the direction and his leadership at North uh, Northern State Correctional Facility. Again, we can't go into deep detail, um, but again, it was a a thorough review by the department and by human resources. And sorry, you said it, the review lasted a month, months. When did this review happen? It's happened over the past month or so. Um, again, Commissioner Demo can give, provide you with more detailed information um, with the exact date. Thank you. Aaron Patanko, VT Digger. Hi, um, I believe this is a question for Dr. Levine. Um, as, as we've been discussing during the presser today, um, you know, the various metrics of, um, you know, measuring COVID in Vermont, case rates, hospitalizations, um, the severity of hospitalizations, we don't often hear um, officials discussing wastewater data, although you've previously mentioned it as kind of an exciting new opportunity um, you know, there's no one um, collected place to see wastewater data in Vermont, and it doesn't seem to be utilized, these pressers, to kind of evaluate how, um, how the state is doing. And I'm also specifically asking that because the latest um, Burlington Wastewater Report showed that COVID was on the rise, um, but it does seem to vary depending on exactly which wastewater plant you look at. Um, so I, I would just appreciate some clarity on how that data is used. Absolutely. Thanks for bringing the topic up. Because it's not just Vermont, it's the whole country that's sort of grappling with how do we use this data, how do we report this data, how do we actually analyze it in a way that uh, it has meaning and can predict future events. Um, so. Burlington is probably the longest standing site in Vermont that's been doing this. And their counts have increased over the last week, 
They have three different, uh, I'll call them watersheds, for lack of a better term. Two of them are very, very modest increases. The third is a larger increase. Although the levels that they're measuring are nowhere near where they were at a peak of various variants in the past. The um, National Wastewater Surveillance System is actually what our newest sites are all uh, reporting to and, and involved with. And their primary metrics are percent total change over a 15-day period. So again, just like I've been emphasizing in other topics here today, not uh, reacting to data uh, that's not able to show trends and that's obtained uh, too quickly in terms of data points from previous data points. We have four sites that are reporting through that system and um, they have enough data to show us a trend and their trend is actually a decrease. Some as low as 10% decrease, others close to 100% decrease. And the curves that you come out with when you look at that actually look very similar to the case curve I provided at the very beginning of the press conference, looking like we're on the tail of Omicron. So there's a little bit of conflicting data with these four sites versus the Burlington site um, that I can't explain, but that is what, what the data is showing at this point in time. We have a couple other sites that are just coming online, so their data has, hasn't really accumulated enough to be analyzed. Um, and we'll have a few other sites that are not even submitting specimens yet, but they are signed up and we anticipate will be doing so in the future. So that's what we have for wastewater data right now. Um, some one piece of data from our largest collector, if you will, that um, is not going in the right direction, but it's not dramatically wrong, and a bunch of data from other sites that actually looks like some improvement. Does that help you? Yeah. Um, are you aware of why the Burlington Wastewater Treatment Plants are not participating in the CDC collection? Um, it does feel like it's difficult to kind of compare apples to apples when you're one's looking at like a 15 day period of percent change and the other is looking at kind of like these hard numbers of, of fiber loads. Yeah, I don't have the firm reason, although my guess would be that they were just very early adopters and got this rolling uh, at a time when frankly the field was much more growing and still learning about what its potential was. Uh, but I'm not sure that's the entire answer to your question. That's as far as I can take it, though. Okay. I also have heard that there's a wastewater treatment plant, uh, Brighton, yes. that is collecting data, but the CDC doesn't release that data because it's less. it's got less than 3,000 people in it. Do you re still receive that data? Are you able to view it? Yes, we have received that data. I don't know what Brighton's most recent data is, but we, we have them as one of our sites. And do you have any, um, I don't know, intentions or discussions about publishing this wastewater data um, separately from the CDC so that, you know, Vermonters can view it? Yes. And again, I think like other states, we're all on the same learning curve and we're just trying to learn how to aggregate the data appropriately and interpret it and make sure that people are appropriately led by it as opposed to misled by it. Yeah. Yeah, so like maybe as part of your kind of endemic transition strategy, coming up with a way to, win, I don't know, release that data in some capacity. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And it's been on our, it's been on our drawing board because uh, I raised this issue quite a number of months ago, even before most of these sites were online. So more to come. All right, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very much. We'll see you again next week.